Okay, so let's share the doobly-doo. Okay, so um, thanks very much for joining. Um, and uh, thanks very much to uh, Jose for inviting me to do this, um, giving me the idea to put it together, giving me kind of an impetus to put all these ideas in a, in a form that's more digestible and more um, to the point. Um, thanks, Adam, for setting up the, uh, the systems for it and uh, OTJ generally. Um, so I think OTJ really represents the kind of um, mutual aid and you know, common culture that I want to encourage with this presentation. So it's, um, it's a good platform for a topic that uh, uh, kind of combines a lot of my interests. So a um, bit about me. Um, I am the you know, younger teacher in, that Jennifer referred to of having less experience when starting out and uh, seeing the lack of resources available for people who are um, trying to just teach things on limited time budget. You know, um, I popped into, I joined Toyo University and we started to make a brand new curriculum. And I found out that you can basically get one absolute garbage textbook on the topic and there's not much else out there. And I thought, I'm teaching, I'm making a curriculum on English as a second language for IT students. One third of the human race is learning English. Surely resources must exist, right? So that started me onto this track of, hey, how can we share resources? How we can share with each other, right? Now, um, I am a phonetician now. So I study the sounds of language and how people pronounce things and phonology. Uh, but as an undergrad, I did history pre-law and um, at the risk of outing myself as an awful bougie bonbon, uh, I'm from a long line of patent lawyers. So in this presentation, I am going to betray my ancestors and encourage you to share your work very freely. However, let me stress, I am not a lawyer nor do I play one on TV. This is not legal advice, and I am not qualified to give you legal advice. This is one teacher telling you what he does and what I think you probably ought to do as well. So being upfront, this presentation is pure propaganda. I want to convince you of two things. First, some things can and should be free. Free as in free speech and free as in free beer. And second, I want to convince you that you can and should share your teaching materials for free. So I'll go over what this open culture concept is all about, how Creative Commons licensing works, and why teachers should care about it. First, let's look at the concept of a commons, where Creative Commons gets its name. So up through the 1500s, most of the land on the planet was open field agriculture. Well, not true. Most of the land on the world on the planet was forest, but the cultivated land was open field agriculture. So peasants worked the land and managed forests and used waste land through quite complex communal controls. Fields for grazing sheep, forests for gathering thatch and firewood, public spaces for gathering, all of these places were the commons. They were held in common. Up through the end of the Bakufu in Japan, most villages had areas of forests or mountains that were managed in common by the villagers themselves. It was highly stable, highly sustainable, obviously, or we wouldn't be here. But that doesn't mean there weren't any rules behind who could use it. Common use doesn't mean completely open use. Successful common pool resources, also called CPRs, are highly managed. There's rules for who can access the resource and when. There are rules for who's involved in the decision-making process. There are rules requiring people who draw on the resource pool to contribute to its maintenance. So the commons has never meant lawlessness. It's quite the opposite, actually. Commons is anarchist in the real sense of the word, lacking in a hierarchical authority structure. So Rather, they're managed horizontally by equals who care about 
the resources the most, the people who use them. Now, delving a little deeper into this, um, contrary to the uh, 1968 quite famous paper in science, Tragedy of the Commons by one Garrett Hardin, modern economists um, like the Nobel Prize winner pictured here, Eleanor Ostrom, um, don't think that that's a very good argument. And it's essentially based on a flawed um, metaphor. Right? Uh, she takes a more nuanced view and says that common pool resources are generally governed at least as sustainably as private held resources and usually much more stably. And her book, Governing the Commons, offers eight principles for designing and maintaining a successful commons. Um, I'm just listening here real briefly. We'll go over how these relate to creative commons and intellectual commons later on. Now, in England, the commons were gradually taken up by private landlords through the Enclosure Acts in the 17th and 18th centuries. And it was believed that farmers working the land in common were not reaping the full benefits of the land, that private landholders would have a greater incentive to ramp up the intensity of agriculture. You know, the, the purpose here was to make more intense agriculture on the land, to get more product out of the land. Uh, the result was an economic boom for a certain wealthy elite and widespread environmental destruction, particularly in Ireland. It also constructed a new landholding class, not quite nobles, not quite industrialists, something between. Japan also enclosed many of those commonly held lands, not all of them. And village councils still control mountains and forests all across the island chain up to the present day. Um, CPR rules in Southern California have held back a lot of the worst effects of drought, not entirely. And there's still a drought going on, but they, um, they were able to manage the resources to some equitable degree. So the point here is that the private ownership over resources is relatively new in human history, and it's by no means universal. There are other models for managing how we use our resources. That brings us to the topic of intellectual property. So what about ideas, the ownership of those ideas? Well, a picture of Mickey Mouse is not much like a piece of land. Looking at the picture doesn't destroy it. Right? Uh, copying Star Wars onto a VHS tape and giving it to a friend doesn't reduce the amount of Star Wars in the world in the way that, say, leaching off a reservoir or using too much of a field for grazing your sheep might reduce the supply of those resources. Now, although patents have existed since the Italian Renaissance, copyright law dates to the 18th century, uh, concurrent with a lot of the enclosure movements. Of course, there's arguments for and against both patents and copyrights. My purpose here is not to tell you that they're great or that they're evil or either way. My purpose is in an intellectual comments in carving out a space for ideas that are not owned, ideas that are shared. So increasingly, things that once belonged to all of us and to none of us now belong to a handful of owners. Uh, Cinderella. Hercules, The Little Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Sleeping Beauty, Thor, Mulan. These didn't belong to anyone until a mouse bought them up. Now, you can still use these stories. You can still make new content based on these ideas. But fly too close to the sun, you'll risk a letter from Disney's lawyers. And their efforts have extended the length of copyright so far that they might as well be infinite. Copyright began with the Statute of Anne in Great Britain in 1710, and that granted publishers a 14-year monopoly. Mickey Mouse was created in 1928, but there is no doubt that he's still the sole property of the Big D and will be for many years to come. Japan is a signatory to the Berne Convention, so that means that technically, they only recognize foreign copyrights for up to 50 years after the death of the author. That means that all of Walt Disney's creations ought to have been public domain in Japan since 2016. But I, for one, do not have the courage to try to publish a manga adaptation of Steamboat Willie. Good luck to you if you do. 
So the open culture movement proposes to carve out an area that is explicitly for sharing. These are not for sole private ownership. These are for all of us. So projects like Wikipedia and Project Gutenberg are attempts to make an intellectual commons, a resource that belongs to all of us and to none of us at once. Now, there are different levels of involvement. Um, creators can choose how much sharing they're comfortable with. So David Revoy's webcomic, uh, shown on the left here, is Pepper and Carrot. Uh, his comics can be shared, remixed, and redistributed freely, as long as whoever's using it credits the author. That's his only restriction. Give him credit, and you can share his comics anywhere you like. You can even sell them, as long as you credit him. I released a series of videos about English phonology and pronunciation on YouTube uh, under a slightly more restrictive license. Um, I require you to uh, attribute me and anything you make, you must also share. I don't mind if you make money on it. I don't mind if you make changes to it, but it must also be for sure. Because to me, it's most important that the ideas that I've put out here are accessible. Um, even Dungeons and Dragons has been in on the game for about 21 years now. Uh, in 2000, uh, the company Wizards of the Coast allowed creators to make spin-off adventures with their D&D rules and even sell them for profit. And the result was a massive explosion in role-playing games. Uh, the R project uh, is statistical software. It's on a very different sort of licensing scheme, but it's also free software, free to download, free to distribute, free to make changes to if you have the programming knowledge. Now, many of us use the Creative Commons license to do this, to share things, but also protect our interests and make sure that people can't take advantage of our work. So it allows us to mark things as shareable, but also prohibit other people from claiming it as their work, which would allow them to come back and sue the original creator for copyright infringement. And no creator wants that. So Creative Commons licensing is one way that you can share your work and contribute to the commons, but still put reasonable limits on how people can use your work. Most basic limit is attribution. Uh, people who use your work, redistribute it or remix it, have to tell people that you made it. So that's just a simple CC by license. It tells readers they're free to use what you've made in their projects. They can put it up on their website for download. They can even sell it as long as they explicitly tell people that you made it. A step up from there is the CC by SA license or attribution share alike. So this one says that people can use your work and share it and remix it and redistribute it, but they need to do two things. First, they need to attribute the work to you. So if you share my YouTube videos, you must first say, Jeff Moore made this somewhere. And second, they need to release whatever derivative work they make under a similar sharing license. So if somebody wants to take my YouTube videos and put a dubstep beat behind it and make the next club jam, they can, but they also have to release it as a free and shareable product. Now, uh, this is the big reason why all of my slides have the CC by SA icon in the bottom left is because I often use a lot of these resources to make my own stuff. The picture you see in the background is under a CC by SA license. So I also have to release it under a share alike license. Everybody who reuses and remixes those things has to do a share alike license all the way down the line. Further step up is to prohibit commercial use of your work. And this is what Bricolage Teacher does. Totally reasonable. It protects you in a lot of ways. Um, I know I would be less than thrilled to see my work being used to sell advertising, for example. Although I understand that a lot of websites need these, the ads to pay for servers. Using this license lets you opt out of having your work used for products that you don't support. And increasingly, I've been thinking about using this myself, but uh, I still feel like it's more important to me to have my work be accessible. And so if people want to use it for commercial products, it doesn't particularly bother me. Now, adding a no derivatives mark is the strictest license that still allows sharing. People can re-host your work 
in its complete original form, but they cannot edit it. This might be a good choice for a very complete and packaged product. So if, for example, you make a photo essay about refugees, um, you don't want your photos to be removed from their original context and used to sell male enhancement pills, right? This could be a good choice. The license says, go ahead, use my work, share it, redistribute it, but make no changes because I want my vision for the work preserved. So going back to the topic of designing a stable commons and how the Creative Commons license works into that, the um, economist Eleanor Ostrom says that a successful commons is clearly defined. It says what it is and who has access to it. Well, the uh, Creative Commons license tells people how they're allowed to use it and, um, and who's allowed to use it and, and who, who the creators are and so on. Uh, adapts to changing local conditions. Uh, it's not very restrictive, right? So you can use the license that works for your particular needs. Uh, managed democratically by its users, anybody can join the Creative, Co the Creative Commons team and vote on how they're going to change things in the future. And the person using it themselves gets to choose the, the license that they use. It's not a top-down thing. Right? You can choose any of the Creative Commons licenses or none, as you choose. Uh, monitoring is a difficult thing. Uh, there is no monitoring system for the Creative Commons licensing system. So creatives, creators themselves sort of have to be on their toes about people using their work and go after them on their own. So that's kind of a downside to it. There's not this uh, large infrastructure around backing up your rights. Um, it also doesn't have any particular sanctions for rule breakers, uh, nor does it have very good conflict resolution mechanisms, but it is recognized by uh, many, many governments in different forms. So, oh, uh, and a uh, small plug, we are actually discussing this book in a separate group later on uh, on Sunday. So if you're deeply interested in the topic of the commons, come join us. Now, um, the, the thing I want to really drive home here is that uh, I want to encourage you to share as much as you can in the ways you're comfortable, right? There's a growing movement toward free culture, free in two different meanings, free in the sense that you have freedoms. So an open license says that private, private individuals and companies don't have the right to infringe on your freedom of speech. They can't tell you how to use a picture, a piece of text, a character, a piece of music. Uh, David Revoy's uh, webcomic, his fantasy webcomic I showed earlier, you are allowed to use his characters in any way that you like, as long as you attribute him. They also maintain your freedom to share and remix in that way. But uh, many of these licenses are also free culture in the sense that it doesn't cost any money. So Wikipedia, Project Gutenberg, they run off to donations, Irasoya provides their images free of charge. These are ways that they can contribute and make very accessible resources for people. Now, the law in Japan. Well, in Japan, all rights are by default held by the author. It's called a presumption of authorship. This includes moral rights, which are non-transferable. So an author has the exclusive right to decide how their work is released, and they have exclusive rights over the integrity of their work, whether or not people can change it, remix it, whether they can make derivative works from it. Um, economic rights are the other form of author rights, and these can be transferred. Most often, this is how creators of creative works get paid is by selling the rights to their works to companies that then reproduce them and sell them. So economic rights include the right to reproduction and communication of the work and adaptations. Now, an explicit license uh, gives you standing in court if someone borrows your work and try, tries to claim that you're infringing on theirs. So, a dated document with your Creative Commons mark 
shows prior work. That means that it shows to a court that you have made this before the other one and therefore their copyright claim is invalid. Unfortunately, it's not the equivalent of registering a copyright in Japan. It is in the US and in many other Western countries. In Japan, you must register with Bunkacho if you actually want to have a registered copyright control over your work. Uh, it's not an incredibly difficult process, but it is some paperwork. Honestly, unless you're planning to make a commercial product out of it, it's probably not worth doing because that's the purpose of the systems, protecting commercial products. So in Japan, the Creative Commons mark acts as a statement of your preferences as a creator. It's not really an ironclad legal contract. Uh, it's more of a defensive thing to make sure that uh, you won't be sued by people who take your work and then make derivatives of it. So these days, there are more free resources available than at any time in human history, right at your fingertips. You've got Wikipedia, Wikimedia, Project Gutenberg, providing most of human knowledge right at your fingertips, right there in your pocket on your cell phone. The Internet Archive giving even more access to all sorts of documents that have been on the Internet before. Uh, but there's many, many others. Uh, I'd also like to point out YouTube is where I've got my stuff up, and you can release things under a Creative Commons license there. Unfortunately, Google does not promote content that uses a Creative Commons license. So you will languish in obscurity, as I have. But it's a useful place for me to put things to give to my students. Uh, Khan Academy is not actually under a free license, but they do provide their stuff for free to others. It's uh, wholly owned by the by Khan Academy, but they're a nonprofit. Right? Bricolage Teacher actually does allow you to share your resources uh, in a totally free way, should you want to. But Bricolage Teacher also lets you choose what kind of rights you want to keep, if you want to keep the right to sell your products, for example. So I'll leave my takeaway ideas up on the slides here and open up to any questions, comments, quibbles, corrections. Go ahead. Before, before we go to Q&A, may I suggest that we open up our microphones and give Jeff a big round of applause. Well done, sir. Thank you. Uh, questions from anyone. I didn't see anything in the chat specifically uh, for the uh, presentation. Jeff, but um, if I might start, okay. please. Okay, uh, I'm sorry, I got taken away kind of partway through. So I don't know if I'm gonna be asking something that's gonna make me look like an idiot because you actually gave the answer during the presentation. But um, I am now considering uh, what I'm going to do about a particular teaching method that I have made. And I'm thinking about uh, plainly how to both get it out to teachers so they can use it and how to monetize it. Um, I'm very enamored of the whole concept of what Creative Commons offers and how it protects both me and, and, and everyone else that's using it. Now, if I was to say to myself, okay, there's this part of what I do that I want everyone to be able to freely access. And right now, I want to just get it out there and I want to do slides based on it. I want to do maybe a couple of videos based on it. And I want to make my, my major um, public presentations based on it. But if someday, and, and I put that under CC, Okay. Now, when I say under CC, um, I'm, I'm not being specific about, you know, no derivatives, share alike, because uh, the, the question comes from here. If I wanted to have um, a CC designation that I could remove at any point in time, is there such a CC designation? Like if I, if I went share alike and att uh, attribute on this, this particular essay that I wrote, and then I realized, wow, that's that's a pot of gold, and I want to actually put that into print so then I can sell it. Is there a way that I can personally revoke the license that I put on it myself so that then I can take it and 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 put it in a book? Ah, so um, under Japanese law, even the Creative Commons license you put on there isn't legally binding. So in a technical sense, um, you can do absolutely whatever you like with that with a CC mark, um, but people just might be a bit miffed that they they were sort of led to believe that they could share something and then you've 
pulled back on. Um, I would say that the um, the ethical way to go about that yeah. is to um, release sort of a prototype of it under a, um, a Creative Commons license um, and then make a derivative work of that, which mm -hmm. could just be adding on to it, right? Mm -hmm. um, that is under a closed license. So in this case, you would want to first choose a non-share alike license. Non-share alike. Right. So if it's share alike, then any derivative that you make, well, you're promising that other people are allowed to make derivatives of it as long as they also share. Right. Now, if you go ahead and make a derivative of your own work and don't make it under share alike, you're legally allowed to do that. Right. You're legally allowed to kind of stop that chain of sharing at any point with your own work. But it's um, a bit of a faux pas, right? Because right, you've told right. other people they're not allowed to do that, but you are. Uh, so I would say the, the sort of non faux pas way to do that is initially um, release it under a license that doesn't have share alike. So I'll pop over to the um, broad listing of Thank kinds you. of licenses. You basically, these function as a kind of yes, no answer system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You decide yes, no to each of these questions as you go down the line, right? Mm -hmm. So if you want to say um, that uh, sharing or remixing is not allowed, then uh, you would leave off the um, share alike part of it. You can just okay. do um, uh, CC by. Right. People have to um, attribute attribute to you. Right. And you can say CC by in C, non-commercial, to say, not only do you have to attribute to me, you're also not allowed to make money off of it. Okay. But I can make derivatives of it, and that derivative work is based on the CC content. But because it's derivative, it is not the CC content. That's right. That I do not have to release, or it is not bound by any previously uh, created licenses on the original material. That's right, yeah. And oh. to, to bring this into kind of a, a practical thing for an academic, let's say that you've got something that you want to get right out there out of your um, doctoral dissertation. Mm -hmm. You can throw that out under a CC license and then make a derivative work off of that. Do something that kind of polishes up chapter four and put that out as a commercial product. And you're well within your rights as a creator to do that. Um, in fact, you're well within your rights as a creator to take anything you've done in Creative Commons and then come back and say, I'm going to make a work based on this that is not open. Okay, good. But the, the community doesn't like that very much. You know? Okay. And I'm, I'm really sorry, Jeff. I, we ended up with just being able to answer my question. Uh, but uh, there are a couple of questions from Jennifer. And, mm -hmm. um, and it's not a question, but uh, I think we have maybe about 20 seconds left. Have you actually written an article for this that goes on bricolage.com? I don't believe I have, no. Please do so, because this is, the, I, I don't know if you consider this important information, but like to see this in print and um, having a way to refer to this would be great. Unfortunately, Doug Strabel is here mm -hmm. and uh, he's the host for the next presentation. Everybody, one more round of applause for uh, for uh, Jeff and Denver. Yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Sir. Yeah, uh, don't forget to, uh, to finish the recording. And um, actually, Jeff, if you know YouTube well enough, maybe you could show Jennifer how to uh, set those up and send them to YouTube and then, and then do the, uh, and then you, because you got to do your own um, upload of the video, if you can maybe uh, show her that too. That would